I can understand when somebody is excited, they just had a child, a son, you know, but when people start to attribute God having a son, what are they actually trying to say? I don't really get this. Yeah, well, that's actually a big discussion been going on for a couple of thousand years at least or more. Doesn't make no sense to me. Well, uh, you'll have people that will try to make sense out of that to you. As a matter of fact, this has been the topic recently when East meets West, when the Muslims and the Christians get together. That's like one of the favorite topics to hit on real quick. Can God have a son? In fact, let's do a program called Can God Have a Son? We should. Oh, that's it. Your cameras are on. Why don't we, we do are, it now? Let, let's start it up. We got you. We got you in the house. Go for it. Assalamu alaikum. Allah, there's only one God, and Muhammad is His messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. Allah. Thank you again for being with us, Shay on the show. Yeah. They caught us in the middle of a conversation. <laughs> so I want to know, what are you trying to tell me? What are you trying to say that well, God the question. actually... Let's sung? look at the question. What is the question? We're saying, can God have a son? Like a baby. Can God have a son? That we you hold, that it suckles and gets milk from its mother, that it comes out of a woman. All right, let's, let's draw some, uh, at least some basic... Uh, ground rules for the discussion. I think that's only fair. Let's get to the perimeters. Well, yeah, because what we want to lay out from the beginning, are we going to have a rational discussion or an irrational discussion? If somebody said, for instance, God can do anything, oh, well, there's no sense in having any discussion anymore because that God could disappear, God could run away, God could die, God could blah, 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 blah. Because when you say something, anything, then the, there's nothing left to discuss. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it from a rational point of view, this is when you're able to understand what we're talking about. And if you really want to have people to listen to your points of view, if you want to talk about your particular faith, it is important to have a rational discussion. Very. Yeah. And now let us take from, from the beginning, before we talk about a son, let's ask the question, can God do anything? Because that is the premise of what I'm saying here is, I'm going to say, no, God doesn't have a son. Of course, you know that. But, but why am I going to say that? Okay, what are my evidences? First of all, I'm going to say that, that God doesn't have human limitations on him. And when you say anything, you're actually going to do the reverse of what you think you're going to do. Let me show you why. If you say God can do anything, one of the things they're going to say is, can God make a rock so big, nothing can move it? Now, let's run that by you again. Can God make a big rock? Yes. Can he make it really dense, really heavy? Yes. Can he make it so heavy that nothing can move it? Yes, he can. Okay, even he can't move it? Now what? Now What's you, the answer? Now you're stuck. You just walk straight into an irrational conversation without realizing it because you didn't set the ground rules where you got there. What you start from the beginning, you say, God doesn't have any limitations. And when you say he doesn't have any limitations whatsoever, you're talking about human limitations. But now you're going to have another problem. But if you, because you're not defining God properly, let us look from God's point of view. And how will we know that? You won't. You won't know that unless you have scripture. Now, we maintain that we have the Quran in the original. We've talked about it in many of our programs. We have a program online, if anybody wants to go. It's called Allah's Quran, A-L-L-A-H-S, Quran.com, and if you go to the website, you can understand why we're saying this. That this is a good way to start. It's a good foundation. Mm -hmm. Having said that, let's consider that if you understand that God is without human limits, then He is the only one who will determine what He is, who He is, and how He is. That's up to Him. And what we know about God is He is the ultimate and the epitome of each of His characteristics. It means that God is all living. He cannot die because he's alive. That's one of his names, al Hai. He doesn't die. So if you say, can God die? No. Oh, that's something he can't do. Hold on a second. That's something he doesn't do because he doesn't have the same kind of limits you and I do. He was without limits, but he never, ever stops being God. So if he did something that was ungodly, then he wouldn't be God when he did it. For instance, he doesn't cheat. Well, how could he cheat? He owns everything anyway. How could he lie? There's no reason for it. There's no benefit for him. So he's not going to lie. It's not a godly thing to do. He doesn't commit adultery. Well, first of all, he doesn't 
copulate. He doesn't have intercourse. This is not something God does. When God creates, according to the Bible, according to the New and Old Testament, and according to the Quran itself, whenever God wants anything done, he says, be, and it is. Kun fayakun. And so if you understand that about God, why are you going to put him in this kind of a condition? Why are you going to try to put him in your little finite mind and say, oh, God can or can't do this, God can or no, no, no. You don't say it like that. You stop and go back to what he says about himself. In the Bible, and now we're going to go back and talk about Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19. Here's where he said God is not a man. It's as simple as that. And God is not the son of man. It's as clear as that. So anyone who claims to be a son of man or a man cannot be God, not according to that verse, if you accept the Bible as legal testimony. Now, for me, I don't need to worry about what this English translation Bible says. I'm going to go straight to the authority, which is the Quran in the original language, and it still says the same thing. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. And that's in chapter 112 of the Quran. He is not the father of anything. He's not the son of anything. It's the exact same statement here. So can God have these things? If it doesn't make any sense that God is going to have things related to the creation. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to take you to another uh, uh, subject. Now, let's go straight to this about Son of God. I wrote a, a paper some time back, and it is called Son of Who? Son of Who? Now, this means that we're going to be, of course, focusing on the prophet Isa or Jesus. We as Muslims have the right to discuss this amongst ourselves without outside interference because this is something relative to us. This is our property because it's in the Quran that we have a prophet. We Muslims have a prophet who's called Isa. Isa. He was born as a miracle birth to Maryam. And there's no human intervention here. There's no copulation. There's no intercourse. There is Mary, who is a very young girl. She gives birth to a baby. No man has touched her. She's given word about that ahead of time by the angel. The angel Jabril or Gabriel comes to her and tells her she's going to have a baby. She asks, how is this possible when no man has touched me? The angel tells her, for God, Allah, this is a simple thing. Whenever he wants anything done, he says, kun, faya kun, be, and it is. So we see immediately that it was the command of Allah. We also find that it says in the Quran, kalamatullah, which means the word of God, God's word, or Allah's word. This is translated from the Aramaic to the Kone Greek, which is the more famous to the Christian. They're not familiar with the original language. They're actually more familiar with the secondary language. Here it says logos. They say Jesus is the logos. Logos simply means word. That's all it means. Kone Greek means word. Translated from kalama. Kalama, word. God spoke the word and the word became flesh. What is the problem? Just because God spoke a word and it became flesh doesn't mean it's God's son. It doesn't mean it's a part of God. After all, in the beginning when he created everything, he said, be, and the world isn't his son, is it? The universe is his son. Why do you make that kind of connection? He said, be, and it is. Let there be light. So what? Light is the son of God? That doesn't make any sense. No. So these are some of the things that you have to take into consideration when people are going to have these kind of arguments or discussions about who is Jesus, who is this person called the Christ. Ah, the fact that he's called the Christ, that proves he's the son of God. Somebody might say that. Well, what are you talking about? Christ is nothing but a Kone Greek word coming from Christos. Christos is the Kone Greek, and then they anglicized it by dropping the S off. Hmm? And just like they did with Logos. When they took off Logos and made it Logo, you have a business, don't you? Mm -hmm. And in your business, don't you have a Logo? A Logo, yes. That's where it came from, Kone Greek. It means a word. Logo means a word. You have a logo, and that represents a whole idea. A single logo represents a whole concept. Is there anywhere, I want to know the one that I love. I love Jesus. As a Muslim, yes. I love Jesus. You have to. I love Jesus. You love Jesus. Of course. And now this is I, not an option. It's not even a discussion point. So tell us from the words of our beloved Jesus, did he ever ex explicit statement say, I am God's only son. I'm God's begotten son. God is my 
uh, literal father, th that I am God's son? We don't know from the Bible, but we know from the Quran. I say we don't know from the Bible because the biblical scholars themselves, and I would like to mention a few, we had the, recently we had Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code that came out and clearly exposed a lot because they were quoting, although it was a fictional story, the quotes that he gave and the information he gave was based on real scholars' work. Yes. In fact, those same scholars sued him for plagiarism. Uh -huh. I don't know if they won or not, but it's not the point. Also, we have another scholar by the name of Richard Elliott Friedman who wrote the book called Who Wrote the Bible? And then we have recently another of the Christian scholars, Richard Elliott Friedman happens to be Jewish, and he's talking about the Old Testament. The New Testament scholars have come to the same conclusion. For instance, F.F. F. Bruce, and then very recently, Bart... Erm. Uh, Erm. Er, Aaron. 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 Yeah. <laughs> he wrote a book, Lost Christianities. After that, he wrote Misquoting Jesus. And when you read it, you're going to say, well, how can I have any faith in the Bible anymore at all? He became an atheist. He was a died-in-the-world, Bible-thumping, Jesus-loving, you know, uh, born-again Christian until he started studying at Princeton. And he found out that all the stuff he was saying and being taught was just air. The actual reality, what he saw in front of him, caused him to lose all faith. And this is what we do not want. We do not want... Jews, Christians, or Muslims to lose faith. What we want to do is come together and come closer on what is true. What can we prove? What have we got evidence for? We need evidence. We have solid Authent evidence. Authentic evidence. I came to Islam because of evidence. I was clearly motivated, clearly motivated by evidence only. And, and the inspiration comes to you, comes to me, after seeing evidence. Then I think, okay, that makes sense. But to blindly follow something and say, this is my faith, that's blind faith. Even the Bible that exists today in English states that you're not supposed to do that. To have blind faith, the blind following the blind. What is that? It's hard, though, when you've grown up hearing people say over and over and over a certain statement. You can't help but fill in the blanks. There are just certain things you're going to say. Whether it's a little jingle from television, somebody starts it, you finish it. Something that you're used to seeing in the news or something that you, you know, hear in the streets that people start a saying, you can't help but finish it because it's what you've heard all your life. And that's what people, all they're doing is filling in the blanks, really. Yeah. Mary had a little... Lamb. It has to be. What are you going to say? Mary had a little Cadillac? It doesn't <laughs> work. It's like, what would you say? So we want the people to stop, use their brain, yeah. think. Don't yeah. let the pastor think for you. Don't let this man over here at CNN think and for you. And don't misquote things. Yeah. What I just said, Mary had a little lamb. That's common. Everybody knows that. But if you misquote it, you could say, uh-huh. See, here's a woman who gave birth to a sheep. So it says, Mary had a little lamb. Don't you say, oh, this woman had a little boy? Oh, okay. You mean by that that she gave birth? Here, we don't mean that at all. We're saying that she owned it. And there's a big difference. If you said God had a son, what are you saying? No. God owns all of his creation, including this great Messiah and prophet. So what we have from a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, copy, what's not a copy of the original, is there anywhere in this that Jesus explicitly, not implicitly, says that I am uh, the Son of God? No, not really. No, okay. Not, he, doesn't, he doesn't say I am. No, he doesn't. He, he actually he, says I'm the Son of Man. This is what we find. About 83 times, yeah. no? One of the things they'll say is, well, look where he said, I am that I am. And that's what God said in the Old Testament, I am that I am. But you don't know what that was even in the Kone Greek. Yeah. All right. For instance, there's another one that when it talks about uh, in John, the Gospel of John, that in the beginning was the Word, mm -hmm. and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and God spoke the Word, and the Word became flesh. And they use all of this to say it was Jesus, but nowhere in those, up until 19 verses after this starts up, do you find the word Jesus is not even connected to the expression. Okay? But actually, in the Greek, which is a translation of a translation of a copy of a copy of whatever, you know, according to these scholars I just quoted from, in the Greek even, it didn't say that. It didn't say that. In the beginning was the word, 
The Word was with God. The Word God. There's no was there. The Word God. That's it. That's how it actually is. So you can't even use that as a basis for the argument. Even a, a copy of a translated copy of a copy of a copy of a, you can't use it because it didn't actually say that. And then we got to go actually back to the time. Like if you say today mm -hmm. in the place where we live in America and you say, I need a lift. Someone's going to think you need a ride. But if you go to England, you say, I need a lift, it's an elevator. So when you go back to the time, <laughs> if you go back to the time yeah. of Jesus, peace be upon him, what were, and the Jews knew this language the best. What did they mean at that time when they referred to Son of God? Did they actually mean what we think it means today? Uh, actually, this is a good point you're bringing up. This is something very famous in the Semitic world for the Jews, for the Arabs, and for the uh, people of the Aramaic uh, descendancy, that they would use this term Ben. Ben actually means the son. For instance, Benjamin is really Ben Yamin, which means the son of the right. Yamin is in, it means the right hand or the right yeah. side. Ben Yamin is the son of the right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ben Kacha was one of the famous uh, tribes. And in Arabic, you, you talk about Beni Hashem. And you're talking about the tribes of the people of Hashem, the Hashemites. And if you said somebody is Abdullah uh, ben Saba, or if you said that, uh, which happened to have been a Jew who came to uh, Islam, uh, somebody is ben Salam, he's the son of. So this is just something that people normally say. Now there's another word, Abd. Abd means the servant of. So people had servants. And many times the servant would take the name of the master as in, I am the servant of so-and-so or the, you know, the slave of so-and-so. Uh, and, and this went on for a long time until Islam came. And then it was forbidden to say that you're a slave anymore because God doesn't like slavery, by the way. Allah doesn't like it. He encourages Muslims to free slaves all the time. So if there's slavery going on, the only real slavery should be the slave is ultimately the slave of Almighty Allah. So Allah, and you put Abd in front of it. Abd, Allah, Abdullah. Have you heard people named Abdullah? Yeah. Abdullah, you probably know somebody named Abdullah. So he's actually the servant of God, servant of Allah, Abdullah. Yes. Well, if somebody was using that term, Abdullah, and then somebody else said Ben Allah, you know, Beni Allah, he's actually saying the son of God, or descendancy of God. So this was someone, a pious person, a righteous Ibn, person. They can say Ibn. Ibn yeah. is another way to say, you say Ben or Ibn, both of these are the same thing. Ibn Allah. So at that time it meant someone righteous? I someone, don't know. I'm yeah. just telling you this is the, the, the words. I'm not going to try to tell you, I'm not going to make up anything. Uh, what I know I'll talk about. What I don't know about, I'll say I don't know. And this is the way that uh, if you want to have a rational discussion, mm -hmm. when you come to a point where you don't know something, you say, I don't know. And this keeps everything on an even keel. And this is one of the things we lack a lot in the West today, is when a person doesn't know, you don't need to punt. You need to stop and say, this is a case where I can't answer that, uh, we'll move on. I see. Okay, well, we're going to answer, uh, ask a couple more questions before we come to a close. So let's go back to, we, we jumped into the Bible a little bit. Let's stay there, then we'll go away from there. But real quickly, if you take where people are saying uh, Jesus is the Son of God, we can go back and say, okay, let's be fair all across the board because the, the Bible actually has sons by the tons. You know, Adam was a son of God, David was a son of God. So why explicitly only to Jesus? Can you give us some examples here? All right. Again, we know in prophecy from the Quran as Muslims, but also for the Jews in their prophecy, where they still have, they're holding on to, they talk about one who will come who is the anointed and the appointed one to be the king of the Jews. And this expression is used in the Bible and it's understood in Arabic as well as the one who is chosen, the chosen one. And this is the one chosen not by the people, but chosen by God. And this is the point of being chosen. Okay, so when you're talking about the chosen one, the, the Jews themselves chose their kings. They 
through their own electoral uh, college, <laughs> like we have today, and chose from their elite, chose who should be the king mm -hmm. amongst them. And when they chose him, then they would give allegiance to him by anointing his head with oil. They anointed his head. It's mentioned in the Bible, the anointing oil and anointing the king. And they would take this uh, olive oil. It's olive oil from mm -hmm. the Holy Land. And then they would put this on his forehead. And the act of doing this in the Arabic language is called mesa, mesa, or wiping. Literally, this is mess, wiping. So it meant, though, anointed, chosen. So he's called the Messiah, Messiah, Messiah. And then it was translated to English, Messiah. Messiah. So he is the chosen, the appointed, the anointed, the king of the Jews chosen by God. This is what it means, and that's where it comes from. So if you said, is Jesus the Messiah? The Jews say, absolutely not, because they are expecting him to come. Their Messiah has to come and lead a physical uh, fight against their foes to lead them as a military structure and overcome the oppressive rulership over them. And that was what they had at the time of Jesus' birth, which was the Roman Empire. And they were subjugated to the Romans at that time and had a horrible time. They were, they were horribly punished and treated bad. Now, we understand it, as Christians do, that in fact Jesus himself was the Messiah. He was the Messiah. But he left, he's with God, and he will come back. This is what we believe. This is what most Christians believe. This is accepted. Now, uh, recently the Catholic Church has overturned that and said, let's don't talk about that anymore. Maybe he's not coming back. Let's don't, you know, don't go into that anymore. But for us, no, we're staying right on it because we have it from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. In fact, Jesus was the Messiah. He was before me and he'll be after me. He's going to come again. And that's how it is. And this fits exactly with some of the prophecies in the New Testament from what's surviving of it. So we see Jesus, peace be upon him, as not a son, a literal son of God, but we do see him as the Messiah, as the Christ. Because in Koine Greek, Christos means anointed or chosen, the appointed one. Mm -hmm. So there's no difference. Christ means Messiah. Messiah means chosen, the one that's coming. And he came. So, okay, what's the big deal? How do you translate that to become a son of God? There's no word son related with it. Some of the other things, a miracle birth. This is another way. Let's change the subject now. The miracle birth. Jesus had no father. Okay, that's it. He must be God's son. No, not, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Let's go back and look at Eve. Eve is created out of Adam. So do you call God her mother? No. Well, if you want to give the exact same application, if you want to use a rational argument, you have to do that then. If you said because uh, Jesus had a mother, Okay, which is Mary, but no father, therefore God is the father. Then go, let's go back to Eve and say, well, gosh, she didn't have a mother, so therefore God's her mother. No. And even then, it's still no reason to worship Jesus, if he, even if it was, which he wasn't. But still, you didn't worship Eve, did you? So why are you worshiping Jesus? And by the way, while we're on the subject of fathers and mothers, who was the father of Adam? And who was the mother of Adam? And in fact, he didn't have either. He was created from dirt. Uh, <laughs> I think a woman coming from a man's bone is pretty wild. That's a miracle, don't you? Yeah. And I think a woman coming from, uh, uh, from a man is pretty wild. It, 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 and then what about a man being born of a woman coming out of her womb, but no man has fertilized the egg? That's not as big a miracle. It's a miracle but not as big because there are animals today that are asexual. There are bees, female bees, that can give birth to a male bee and there was no intercourse. So, but how about this? And let's go to the big one. Adam had no father, no mother, came out of dirt. If you want to worship somebody based on their creation, Adam is in line. He is the guy to go to. Yeah. If you want to use that as a rational argument. And of course, we don't worship Adam either. We worship the God that created Adam from dirt. We worship the God that created Eve from the bone. We worship the God of Jesus 
And Jesus was created of a woman who had never been touched by a man. And in any case you look at it, any of the miracles that any of the prophets did were still from God. According to the prophets themselves, I don't do anything of myself. I do it by the one who sent me, the one above, the one in authority, the one who is the creator, the one who allows these things to be done. They attribute it to Jesus. But in fact, even the miracles that he did about the leprosy, of, uh, at the time of Moses, it says in the Bible, he put his hand into his coat and he pulled it out. His hand was leprous as snow. He put it back in, pulled it out again, and it was clean. In the Quran, it says that he put it in, it came out shiny. It didn't say it was leprosy, but beside the point, if you want to say something here, what happened to his hand? And you want to talk about coming back to life, what about the dry bones, the dry bones of Ezekiel that they used to bring dead people back to life? That was long before Jesus. So bringing somebody back to life also doesn't mean Jesus is God or a son of a God. It means he did miracles to show people he was who he said he was. He was the Messiah. He was the one who was sent and the Jews, for the most part, ignored it, disowned him, and really wanted to do him in. And they now, didn't want to accept it. And now we as Muslims, we accept that he was one of the mightiest totally. messengers of God. Absolutely. So please give us, the audience, some advice. Those who now are just filling in the blanks. They're going along with something that their grandfathers, their fathers taught them. Something that actually you believe, being a former Christian preacher, minister, give some advice to those who are still stuck on this concept. One of the things I would do is just quote to you from two sources and let you think for yourself. I want to go to the Quran. It says in Quran chapter 39, uh, verse 53. It says, Say, O my servants who have transgressed against their souls, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. For Allah forgives all sins, for he is all forgiving, most merciful. If anyone, I'm going to accept chapter 4, verse 110. If anyone does evil or wrongs his own soul, but afterwards seeks Allah's forgiveness, then he will find Allah forgiving, most merciful. Chapter 2, Surah Baqarah, verse 21, it says, O you people, adore your guardian Lord who created you and those who came before you that you may become righteous. This is showing you who is Allah. Because this isn't Jesus. This is God. This is the one that Jesus also needs this relationship with him. You were talking about relationship. And in Mark, here we have Jesus. I'll go to the Bible. It says, why do you call me good? There's none good but God alone. God is good. He's saying, no, don't call me that. And in 5.17, don't think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy, but rather to fulfill the prophecies. And not until all things are accomplished shall a single dot, jot, iodia of the law be in any wise lesson. Whoever breaks the least commandment and teaches this, he will be the, uh, the least in the kingdom. But whoever keeps commandments and teaches that, he'll be the highest in the kingdom. So we see clearly that Jesus is talking about keeping the law, following God, and the relationship, and this is the cap. You want the cap to the whole thing that we're talking about? Yes. You ready? Yes. Question. Who... Did Jesus pray to and why? Why did Jesus pray and to whom did he pray? It's a good question. Let them ponder and think now. We got a website for that. We got a good website. And it's called, it. yeah, it's called BibleIslam.com. BibleIslam.com. And if you've been to some of our other websites, you already know about islamcode.com you know also about the other one we mentioned in the program when we were talking about 911 bible but any of them you go to you're going to find similar stories that will help you thank you again for being with us and i'd like to thank everybody for tuning in to the dean show every week on the dean show we try to bring you a new episode and just to recap god doesn't have a son god cannot be a man God is distinct from his creation. And if you can dig worshiping the creator and not his creation, then you can dig Islam. And that's the main message, to worship the creator and not his creation and to obey his commands. And at the end, you got paradise. So we'll see you again every week. Stay tuned, a new show. And you can also visit us on thedeanshow.com. And the other, if you have any uh, questions regarding the Bible, 911bible.com. And we'll see you again on the Dean Show. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you.